All right, time to start our session. Tonight, our subject is The Christian is Prepared. And our speaker is our brother Caleb Hall. He comes to us from Fayette, Alabama, where he serves as an evangelist there. He is an Alabama boy like me. And uh, the gospel works, folks. And one of the evidence is this. I really like Caleb a lot, and I'd like to think he likes me. He's an elephant, and I'm a tiger. And he probably would tease me more if he wanted to. Because everybody knows, Auburn, Auburn guy, everybody knows Alabama's the greatest football team ever. I'm an Auburn fan, I said that. You write that down. <laughs> Don't make any hogs mad. You know, that was my benefit coming here as an Auburn fan. They say, who cares? <laughs> we don't like Alabama. I said, 10-4. The gospel really works, though. We like to tease about that stuff, but, you know, we be brethren, like Abraham said. We be brethren. Tonight, he'll be preaching on how the Christian is prepared, and that's so very important. Before the sermon tonight, uh, our brother Ron will be leading a song, and also he'll be leading the song of invitation after the invitation is extended. And then after the song, our brother Ben Towery will be leading us in prayer. Let's begin. If you mark your books to number 411 will be the song of invitation. Number 411 will be the song of invitation at the appropriate time. Before that, we'll sing number 563. Number 563.
Let's all bow. Our God and our Father in heaven, the, the great I am, the one we love, the one that, that we cherish and honor, Father of, of all creation and all things, we, uh, we bow humbly before thee, Father. We love thee. We are in awe and wonder, Father, of the depths of your love for us. And we're careful and, and mindful, Father, to reflect upon all that you blessed us with, to give thee praise and honor and thanks for it, Father. We do love thee. We love thy ways. We, uh, we love how much you have loved us, Father, and how much you have shown it. As we've sang tonight, Father, we, uh, we recognize that. We pray that you continue to look upon us, that you'll give us those things that you see we have need of, that we might use those things that you give us in service to thee in a way that you'd have us to. We're thankful, Father, for your son, and as we sang and reflected upon him as well tonight, Father, we are mindful of the ultimate sacrifice that he paid for us. We're mindful, Father, how he came to live as an example for us, how he came and was willing to suffer and die in our stead, Father. We understand through the cruelty and the shame of the cross there came hope and there came a way of salvation and a way for us, Father, to, uh, to be redeemed, and we're thankful for it but we know that it was a deep, deep price. We love thee. We love your son. We're thankful, Father, that you brought us here tonight. We're thankful for your revealed will. We're thankful for the Bible that gives us guidance and instruction, helps us, Father, to build our hearts and minds in a way that you'd have them to be built, that it helps mold us and to make us into the individuals that you'd have us to be. And as we're here tonight, Father, and we'll be reflecting upon your word and uh, the things that help us to understand how we can be prepared, Father, to be children of thine and to act and live in the way that you'd have us to. We pray, Father, that we're careful, attentive listeners here tonight, that we're listening with open hearts and open minds, that we have open Bibles, Father, that we're comparing your word to those things that are spoken, that we're seeking to make application in our lives and understanding, Father, the, the ways that we can employ the things that we will learn and glean from your word. And we're thankful for our speaker tonight. We're thankful for this good brother. We're thankful for the work that he's put into studying thy word and preparing the things here for us, Father. We pray that he'll deliver it in simplicity and truth and that he won't hold back because we, uh, we're in need of hearing it, Father. We're praying that there will be a, um, a refreshing and a revival among your church. We pray that there will be more and more that will turn, Father, and once again diligently seek thee out and strive to earnestly live in the way that you'd have us to, to do the work that you've set out there for us, Father. Not because we, uh, we seek to earn your approval or to seek to earn our salvation, Father, but because we recognize what you have given us and we love thee, Father, and we want to show you how much we love you by the works that we do in your name. We ask, Father, that you be with us throughout this night. We pray that um, this lectureship will be good for each and every one that has been here and those that will be listening online and those that will have opportunity to be here in the coming days. Pray, Father, that you'll be with each and every one of us, that you'll watch over us. Uh, keep us safe throughout this life, Father. Help us to do those things that are right and the things that we should do and hinder us from the things that are wrong. We love thee, Father, and we pray that you'll keep us close to thee always. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. It is great to be here with you tonight. I want to begin by giving my uh, gratitude to the elders and the leaders of the various congregations uh, that uh, sponsor this lectureship every year and have seen fit to, uh, to continue to do this and to have God's word preached. And, and you're to be commended for your foresight and for your wisdom and, and having this uh, lectureship and in covering the topics that have been covered in past years uh, and in this year as well. And so thank you very much for the invitation to be here uh, with you tonight. Uh, you're all to be commended tonight for being here. I know that it's Friday night and uh, you could have made a decision to be in any other number of places tonight and instead you made the decision to be here and so you're to be commended for being here this evening to study together uh, from the Word of God. I've been thinking today about the little boy who uh, had made it his practice of sneaking into the general store and getting behind the storekeeper to get to the barrel of molasses. And the little boy would get to that barrel and he would reach in and he would scoop some of that out and get it in his mouth and then run out of the store before the, the storekeeper could catch him. Well, one day the storekeeper decided he was going to lie in wait for that little boy and he did. And uh, so he waited and here come the little boy sneaking in, he thought, uh, unnoticed. 
And just as he dipped his hand in the barrel of molasses, the storekeeper picked him up, set him inside the barrel, and then proceeded to put the lid on the barrel. And just before the little boy's head went under, the little boy said, Lord, please help my tongue measure up to this great opportunity. <laughs> That's been my prayer today, that my tongue might be able to measure up to the great opportunity that we have this evening to study about Christians being prepared. There are ten young women who are seemingly equal in every way, except that Jesus defines five of them as being wise and five of them as being foolish. Now, I don't know if you've ever really taken the time to consider how serious it is when the Bible calls somebody a fool, but that's a serious thing. In fact, I remember growing up, Mr. T was on the television saying, I pity the fool, and and, uh, boy, I repeated that one day in the living room, and that was the last time I repeated it because my mother said, we don't say that. I said, well, why don't we say that? Well, because Jesus warns us not to use that phrase flippantly. It's a, it's a serious accusation to call someone a fool. Matthew 5 and verse 22, Jesus says, you don't do that for just no reason. You search through the scriptures, and, and as good as a definition as I could come up with, now you might be able to come up with one better, but it seems to me that when you, when you consider the totality of the verses in the Bible that call someone a fool, that it seems to me the simplest and, and most easy to understand definition of what a fool is, biblically speaking, is someone who is careless with their soul. You think about uh, the psalmist said, The fool hath said in his heart that there is no God, Psalm 14 and verse 1. Well, why is it foolish to say that there is no God? Because in saying that, you risk your eternal soul. You think about the man that we call the rich fool from Luke chapter 12, who had, uh, by all means in this life, was a very wise man. He had done well for himself, had been very successful. So much so, he said, I'll tear down my barns and build greater, and I'll say to my soul, soul, take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. And God said, thou fool. This night shall thy soul be required of thee, and then whose goods thou these sh shall these things be? Why was he a fool? Because he was ignorant? No. Was he a fool because he was lazy? No. Was he a fool because he was unsuccessful? No. He was foolish because he had taken no thought whatsoever for his soul. And so it seems to me when the Bible calls someone foolish or call someone a fool, it's because they have done something which puts their eternal soul at risk, and they've been careless with their soul. And so tonight in Matthew chapter 25 and verses 1 through 13, when five of these young women are called foolish and five of them are called wise, Jesus is telling us in this parable that five of them were careful with their souls, and five of them were careless with their souls. And the difference between the two was preparation. The difference between the two is that the five wise were prepared and the five foolish were not. Tonight I want to consider with you just three points. I want to consider with you the text, the traits of preparation, and then we'll talk about the transformational instruction of preparation. Let's start together with the text, and I want to begin by reading together Matthew chapter 25 and verses 1 through 13. Jesus says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. 
Tonight, let's talk about Christians being prepared. I hope I'm hitting the right button there. There we go. Christians being prepared. I want to notice first with you the customs of the parable as we consider the text. When it comes to the parable, we understand that a parable was simply an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. In fact, when you search out Jesus' parables, you'll find that he often used things that were very commonplace to them, things that they saw on everyday occasions that would have been um, uh, immediately recognizable and vivid in their minds as he made some spiritual application from these everyday occurrences. Well, the same is true with this parable. Uh, one particular individual, Craig Blomberg, said this about the custom which Jesus is relying on as he tells this story. He says, typical customs of first century Palestinian wedding activities are on display in this parable. There's a welcoming processional which escorts the newly married couple from the bride's home to a great banquet at the bridegroom's home. Some unspecified time after the legal nuptials have been exchanged, torches light the way in the darkness so that all the bridesmaids have to take enough oil to keep them burning for as long as might be necessary. In other words, it was their custom that after two had entered into the bonds of marriage that the groom would go to get his bride from her house. Her bridesmaids would then line the streets, if you will, or the path from her father's house or from her home to the groom's home. And that was their job, was to keep that path lit for the newly married couple on the way to the groom's home. Keep that in mind as we go throughout this text this evening. This would have been a regular part of their life. This would have been something that the hearers of Jesus would have seen on a regular basis. It would have no doubt brought to their minds times of joy, times of celebration, Perhaps as Jesus tells this story, they even think about some of their loved ones, some of their kinfolks who have recently entered into the bond of marriage and who had recently had their own procession and perhaps they had even been a part of that in some way. And so as Jesus tells this, you just imagine that in the beginning they're, they're thinking about a joyous thing, a, a time of celebration and great joy. But everything in the parable changes when Jesus says, but the bridegroom tarried. And you might even want to underline that in your Bibles or circle it if you'd like to mark in your Bibles because the whole tenor of the parable changes with that statement. But the bridegroom tarried. Until that point, everything is festive, everything's celebratory, everything's joyous. But the bridegroom tarried. Let's talk for just a moment about the characters of the parable. See, Jesus is relating every aspect of this parable to someone or to something. When it comes to the characters of the parable, we understand that the bride is the church. Now, the bride's not mentioned explicitly in the parable itself. But if there's a bridegroom, there must by necessity be a bride. Well, we know that Jesus is the bridegroom. And Ephesians chapter 5 tells us that the church is the bride of Christ. And so if Jesus is the bridegroom, then the bride in this whole event must be the church. And since the entire parable hinges upon the typical customs of the wedding procession of that day, then we can make uh, uh, certain conclusions that the procession itself, that the whole event is about the occasion when Jesus, the groom, is going to come to the house of the bride, his church, his bride, and to take her from her earthly home here back to his house. And the bridesmaids, these ten young women, are supposed to be the Christians who light the way for everyone to see the path from the earthly home here to the heavenly home there. Those are the characters of the parable. And he said, now wait a minute, preacher. You're telling me that all ten of these young women represent Christians. Yes, I am. You say, well, five of them are foolish. Five of them don't go into the feast. Five of them are not prepared. That's right. But I want you to notice that initially, initially all ten are part of the wedding party. And initially all ten of them have their lamps burning. All ten of them are lighting the way for a period of time. It's not until the bridegroom tarries that the distinction between the wise and the foolish 
begins to take place. All ten of these young women represent Christians who were supposed to be lighting the way. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven, Matthew 5 and verse 16. Showing everyone how to get from here to there. But five of them were not prepared to do that for the long haul. Five were, but five were not. Before we go further, I think it's important for us to consider some challenges that this parable presents to us. I don't mean that these are challenges in the sense that they're hard for us to understand or, or hard concepts for us to grasp. I mean these are things that we have to wrestle with. These are things that the parable reveals to us that challenge us and remind us of certain truths that we need to keep in mind every day. One of those challenges is the delay. As I mentioned, everything in the parable changes when uh, Jesus says, but the bridegroom tarried. He was delayed more than any of them could have imagined. You'll notice in verse 5 it says, they all slumbered and slept. The bridegroom tarried longer than even the five wives had expected him to tarry. So much so that they had all gone to sleep that night. They all slumbered and slept while they were waiting on the bridegroom to come and make his way with his bride to his house. At midnight, the cry comes and five of them must face the reality that they are not prepared. This reminds us, friends, that when we entered into service in the Lord's army, we entered into a lifetime contract. When you sign up for the military... You can sign a, a four-year or, or six-year agreement to dedicate that much of your life to our nation's military service. And at the end of that period of time, you may sign up for a longer period of time. Or, or you may decide to stay in until you reach the point of retirement. The point is, is that in, in some of that, you've got a choice. You can say, I want to serve the United States military for so many years, and then I don't want to serve the United States military anymore. You don't get that option when you obey the gospel. When you obey the gospel, you enter into a lifetime service to our Lord, to the bridegroom. And, and the truth is, is we don't know how long of a delay there's going to be between the time that we obey the gospel and the time that our service is over. That Jesus could come back tonight. Jesus could come back tomorrow. Jesus could come back next week. And our tour of service, so to speak, would be over. Or our lives may come to an end at any point in time. And at that point, our tour of service may be over. But until our lives end or the Lord returns, we are to continue through the delay as valiant soldiers of Christ serving in the army of our Lord. The delay reminds us of that. Not only are we challenged by the delay, but we're challenged by the demand for individual long-term preparations. Again, when we obeyed the gospel, friends, we didn't sign up for the short term. I hope that it was made clear to you if when you obeyed the gospel, when you put on Christ in baptism, that you were making a lifelong commitment to no longer live for yourself, but to live for Christ, Galatians 2 and verse 20. Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. But notice that the parable teaches us that that kind of preparation has to be individual. I don't know how you read the text when the five foolish come to the five wise and say give us of your oil but I have to think that there was panic in their voices and they're saying give us of your oil and the five wise say to the foolish we cannot lest we have not enough for ourselves and for you see they couldn't prepare long term for the foolish just like you can't prepare long term for those that you would like to be faithful unto death. You know, if I could make that decision for every person, I would. Brother Stephen, I know if you could make the decision to be faithfully unto death for every uh, member of the congregation in Benton, you'd make that decision for them. But we can't prepare for our brethren. 
This is individual long-term preparation that every person who obeys the gospel of Christ must make the commitment to do so for themselves. And this parable reminds us of that challenge. This parable reminds us of the challenge of the door. I, I think perhaps the most impactful statement of the entire parable is when Jesus says, And the door was shut. It's a reminder to us that there comes a time when it's too late to make preparations. There comes a time when it's too late and the door to the feast has been shut. All of this to emphasize in verse 13 where he says, Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. There are a few different ways that a person can find the door shut. You know, uh, Paul said, quench not the Spirit. Why? Because a person can so resist the Spirit to the point that their conscience has been seared and they can no longer respond to the calling of the Spirit or the Gospel. And the door is shut. A person can wait too long and enter into a state of life where they're no longer able to make the decision to obey the gospel. And the door is shut. A person can wait like the rich man of Luke chapter 16 until he lifts up his eyes in torment and he's begging from the other side, come and just uh, dip uh, your, your finger with water on, on just to cool my tongue. And Abraham said, we cannot because there is a great gulf fixed so that you cannot cross over to us nor, nor us over to you. Why? Because the door is shut. And it's too late to prepare. A wise saying is never put off until tomorrow the things that you know you need to do today. Because the truth is that tomorrow the door may be closed. And our opportunity to get prepared has passed us by. We're challenged by the declaration in verse 10 and verse 13. In verse 10, Jesus says, While they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. And then verse 13, Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Jesus is saying, Get ready. Get ready. We understand that we get ready by obeying the gospel. Obeying the gospel involves having faith, of course, Hebrews 11 and verse 6, because without faith it is impossible to please God. Repenting of our sins, Acts 17, 30, Paul said, God has now commanded all men everywhere to repent. We know that it involves confessing with our mouths that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Romans 10 and verse 10. And we know that it culminates in the act of baptism, being buried with Christ to have our sins washed away, Acts 2 and verse 38, Mark 16, 16, 1 Peter 3 and verse 21. That's how an individual gets ready. But listen to me tonight. While this parable reminds us of the need to get ready, Jesus' point in this parable is not about getting ready. It's about staying ready. Staying ready. Now, if you haven't gotten ready tonight, we want to encourage you to do that, to obey the gospel, to get ready. But by and in large, the point for us to emphasize tonight is the need for us to stay ready. You think about uh, times when it's too late, as I mentioned, and the door will be shut. But you know, if we stay ready, we don't have to worry about that. We don't have to worry about that door of opportunity closing. In fact, we'll be able to look forward to that with confidence and hope and knowing that we'll go into the feast. Finally, then, we're challenged by the difference between planning and and preparation. I don't know if you've ever thought about the difference between those two terms. We use them interchangeably sometimes, planning and preparation, but they're really two very different things. You know, uh, my wife and I, we sometimes have the practice, though we don't always stick to it very well, we sometimes uh, have the practice of sitting down on a Friday or Saturday and planning out our meals for the next week. 
We do that to try to be somewhat healthy and also to help our grocery budget with the family of six. And so, you know, there, there are some uh, advantages to doing that. But, you know, we sit down and we talk, okay, what are we going to make? What do we, you know, uh, what, what do we want to get at the store? And we plan out Monday through, uh, you know, Friday what we're going to have for supper every night. But, you know, as we sit there and we write that out on a, on a piece of notebook paper, the planning has taken place. But what's missing? You know, if we, if we set that piece of paper over on the counter and we never actually go get the things that are needed to prepare those meals, what have we done? What have we accomplished? Absolutely nothing. And friends, that's the difference between planning and preparing. Planning is internal. Planning is having the idea or, or uh, the, even perhaps the conversation of doing something. In other words, to plan to do something is to intend to do something. But to prepare something is to initiate. And Jesus' point here is not for us to plan to enter into the feast, but prepare to enter into the feast. I would submit to you tonight that all ten of these women, all ten of these virgins, these young women, plan to be in the feast. But only five of them prepared to be there. And so we're reminded of that challenge. We don't want to just think about heaven. We don't want to just think about evangelizing. We don't want to just think about studying our Bibles and praying every day. We don't want to just meet together on committees and develop a plan. At some point, friends, we actually have to initiate all the things that we've been planning. Otherwise, we're not prepared. That's the text that's before us tonight. Now let's zoom in a little bit closer on preparation. Having a better concept of the text, let's think about what this parable teaches us when it comes to being prepared. And there are, there are two things that this parable tells us preparation prevents and two things that it tells us preparation provides. The two things that preparation prevents, number one, is false hope. In verse 5, the text says, While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. Have you ever wondered how they could go to sleep that night? And, and I don't know about you, but sometimes I wonder how it is that the individuals who should be the most concerned about their spiritual state seem to be the ones who are least concerned about it. You know, uh, you, th you take a, a loving mother and father who are faithful members of the church and they've got a child who's not and who's living in sin and the mother and father will spend nights weeping and praying for their child and the child goes through life seemingly unaware that anything's wrong with their spiritual state. Why is it that the parents are weeping and the one who's in sin seems to have no conscience uh, issue with it whatsoever? How could these five foolish young women go to sleep that night knowing that the bridegroom had not yet come and they were not prepared to wait any longer. How'd they go to sleep? Well, some might offer some uh, solutions. I've heard it said that perhaps they sleep because of exhaustion or maybe they slept because their conscience had been seared as you make some spiritual application. And tonight, among some of those other answers, I might submit to you that maybe it's the case that these five foolish were able to sleep because they slept with a false hope. Maybe it's the case that they were able to close their eyes and go to sleep that night because they had a false sense of security in doing so. Where does a false sense of security come from, spiritually speaking? You know, maybe it was the case that these five foolish young women uh, were able to sleep with a false sense of security because of what someone had told them. Maybe someone had told them it was okay. Maybe someone had said, it's okay if you don't have enough oil in your lamp. The groom is love and he loves you and he's so thankful that you're part of his wedding party that he'll be just fine with you the way that you are. Don't worry about whether or not you have any oil for your lamp. Maybe someone tried to reassure them. And so they ended up with false hope. We know people like that, don't we? Individuals who are going through life right now, you can probably think of a loved one, a friend, or a family member right now who lives every day with a false sense of hope for eternity because somebody has told them that the way they are is just fine. 
Maybe they had a false sense of security because they had been prepared in the past. You know, as I mentioned, their lamps were burning at one time. And so maybe it's the case that, that they were able to sleep because they were relying on preparations of the past to get them through the future. We know people like that, don't we? Once faithful members of the body of Christ who perhaps have not attended worship or taken part in the activities and the work of the church for some time and yet still sleep each night with a false sense of eternal security because of the preparations they made in the past. Maybe they had a false sense of security that had been extended to them simply because they were present. You know, maybe it was the case that in their minds they were thinking, you know what, I'm here. I'm here and that counts for something. And so just by being here, that means I'm ready to go uh, to eternity. We know people like that, don't we? Individuals who perhaps have obeyed the gospel and sit in our pews every Sunday. Now, they never take part in works of evangelism, edification, or benevolence. They don't read their Bibles and pray every day, but they are present and their card, their ticket has been punched for being at services that Sunday or that Wednesday. And just because they're present, they have a false sense of security. Maybe their false sense of hope extended from one of these things. Maybe it came from something else. Either way, they closed their eyes in peace when there was no peace. Friends, preparation would have prevented that false hope. But number two, preparation prevents fear. As I mentioned to you in verses uh, 6 through 10, when the five foolish run to the five wise, when I read that, I, I, I picture five frantic young women doing everything they can to get ready at the last second. The sound has, uh, the trumpet's been blown, the sound's been made, the announcement has been heralded. The bridegroom is coming, and they're awakened from their sleep, surprised. They realize that they're not ready, they're not prepared. They go to the wise, give us of your oil so that we have enough to go in. And the, the wise say, we can't do that. You go to them that sell and buy. And I imagine they went to the ones who sold as quickly as they possibly could, got there, uh, tried to purchase some oil, and they get back all to find that the door has been shut. And I imagine that they begin beating on the door. It wasn't just a, a, a quiet knock. It wasn't a, a ring of a doorbell and saying, uh, um, uh, yes, uh, hello, we'd like to come in, please. I imagine they were beating on the door saying, we're here. We're ready now. Let us in. And the bridegroom says, I know you're not. What do you mean you don't know me? I was standing out there earlier. Ask your bride. She knows me. Your bride remembers me. And yet the door stayed shut, didn't it? I read those words with fear and panic. And I think about how many, when the trump of God is sounded and Jesus descends from heaven with all of his mighty angels and in all of his glory, Matthew 25 tells us. You know, when Jesus came the first time, he came without any glory initially. He was born in a manger. There was no room for him in the end. He wasn't born to a king. He was born to a carpenter. But when he comes again, he's going to come in all of his glory. And for how many that's going to produce fear and panic? Preparation prevents that. Preparation prevents that fear. But then there are two things that preparation provides. Number one, preparation provides true peace. Again, you go back to verse 5. And they all slumbered and slept. For the five foolish, that was a terrible thing to do. But for the five wise, they could sleep with such peace. The peace of mind that passes all understanding. Philippians 4 and verse 7. Why? Because they knew when they closed their eyes. That it didn't matter what time the bridegroom came. 
It didn't matter if he waited until the wee hours of the next morning. They were ready. They were prepared for however long it took. Reminded of an old story about a, a farmer who was looking for a new hand on his farm. And he would put an ad in the paper and nobody had responded. And finally one young man responded to his ad. And so he meets with the young man and he says, uh, Son, I understand you want to come work on my farm. And the, the young man said, Yes, sir, I do. And the farmer said, Well, uh, uh, do you know how to run a tractor? And he said, No, sir, never been on a tractor in my life. Farmer said, okay, well, uh, have you ever worked with cattle? And the young man said, no, sir, I, I don't know that I've ever even seen a cow in person. Farmer said, okay. He said, uh, do you know anything about uh, 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 crops or, or, you know, tending to crops? And he said, no, sir, we never even had a, gr a garden growing up. The farmer finally said, son, what can you do? And the young man said, well, I can sleep when the wind blows. Farmer thought that was sort of a... Funny answer, but nobody else had applied for the job, so he hires the young man. A few weeks go by, and there's a storm on the horizon, and the farmer is in a panic. He runs out in the middle of the night, and he goes to check on the cattle, and he finds them safe and sound. He runs to check on the hay to make sure that it's tarped down like it's supposed to be, lest the wind blow it everywhere, and it's tarped down, it's taken care of. Checks on a few other things and finds out that everything is just as it needed to be for the storms to come. And then he remembered what the young boy said. And he went and found him, sleeping peacefully, even though the storm was coming. Why? Because he made all the preparations before he ever went to sleep. That's these five wise young women. They had made all the necessary preparations and so they could sleep with true peace. But not only does preparation provide peace, but then it provides passage. I want you to notice in verse 10, Jesus says, And while they, the foolish, went to buy, the bridegroom came, notice this, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage. Friends, the difference between being prepared and not being prepared is the difference between having passage into the wedding feast or being left out in the cold. Preparation provides passage. For the time that we have left tonight, the theme of the lectureship is transformational instruction. I want to share just a few thoughts with you about how preparation transforms every aspect of our lives when we're prepared. Not only does it transform us from being foolish to being wise, but ultimately preparation transforms our eternity. Preparation transforms our outlook on eternity from eternal destruction and hellfire to an eternal home with God. To the land of no mores, Revelation 21 and verse 4, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more death. Neither shall there be any more tears, for God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. For the former things have passed away. What a beautiful blessing and hope that is that we have because of the transformation that is provided through preparation. When we are prepared, our eternity is transformed. When we're prepared, our daily lives are transformed. You think about how making the decision and the commitment to live each day for Christ changes everything about your daily life. It changes the way that you think. Paul said, brethren, whatsoever things are good, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Who thinks that way? Prepared people. You think about how preparation changes the way that you walk. 1 John 1 and verse 7. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us continually, cleanses us from our unrighteousness. You think about how preparation changes what it is that we produce on a daily basis from producing the fruits of the flesh to producing the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5. Being a prepared people changes our very character. 2 Peter 1, 5-11, those Christian graces. 
Add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness. By the way, every single one of those characteristics, not a single one of them comes to us naturally. Not a single one. In fact, our natural inclination is to do the opposite of those Christian graces. Who lives that way then? Prepared people. People who have made a commitment and an earnest uh, uh, appointment for themselves to live with those characteristics. By the way, that's our daily service, Romans 12, 1 and 2. Paul said, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, being not conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewing of your mind. Preparation will transform our worship. I can't emphasize this point to you enough. Uh, listen, we, we've got four little ones. And, and I know that worship on Sunday morning can be a strain when, when you're trying to... Let, let me back up a little bit. I know because of what my wife has told me <laughs> that it can be a strain. The reason I say that is because I'm usually at the office pretty early on Sunday morning and she gets them ready and two services, and, and so I know a lot of that burden falls upon her. And, and I know that we get busy, and I know how things happen, but listen, when you search through the Scriptures, when individuals worship God, they took time to prepare for that worship. Abraham, in Genesis chapter 22, and, and you think about what Abraham was going to have to do that day. Abraham was told to take the son whom he loves. By the way, the first time that you see the English word love in your Bibles, it's right there. And Abraham is told to take the son whom he loves and sacrifice him. You know how hard it would be to get ready to do that? And yet the text says that Abraham rose up early and began preparing the things that were needed. Job in Job 1 and verse 5, Jacob, 20, uh, Genesis 28, 18, Moses, Exodus 24, Hannah, 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 19, Hezekiah, 2 Chronicles 20. All of these individuals who worshiped God rose early to prepare for worship. And what I would submit to you tonight is, is that too often times when we get to worship, we've woken up late, we get in a mad rush. Because we're rushing, everybody's on edge. We're hollering at each other. We're hollering at the kids, trying to put a smile on to greet our brethren. We've not given any time to prayer. We've not given any thought to the sermon that's ahead or to the songs that we're going to sing. And then we get out of worship and want to know why we didn't get anything out of worship. But if we'll stop, and take time to prepare for worship. To think about the contribution we're going to make with a cheerful heart. To think about the memorial that we're going to observe. And what it means for all of mankind. To spend just a moment in prayer. I promise you it will change the way that you worship. It will transform it. Preparation transforms our response in times of trouble. Daniel, in Daniel chapter 1, King James Version says, Daniel purposed in his heart not to be defiled with the king's meat. I don't want to add anything to Scripture that's not there, but if I could take just a little liberty tonight and change the word purpose and say that Daniel had prepared his heart not to be defiled by the king's meat. And by the way, I don't think it was just by the king's meat. I think Daniel had prepared his heart not to be defiled by anything. And his three friends followed suit. By the way, Daniel chapter 3, I think one of the most powerful statements of Scripture, when the king gives Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego a second opportunity to bow down, he says, when the music's played, you can bow down now. And they said, let it be known unto thee, O king, that our God is able to deliver us, but if it be not so... Three men who were so in tune with the will of God that they said, it's not about what our God is able to do. It's about what it is His will to do. And whatever His will is, we're fine with that. That's preparation. They didn't wait until that day to do that. At some previous point in their lives, these men had decided, it doesn't matter what's going to happen to us, we will serve God and no other God. That's preparation. 
difficult times, troubled times are going to come our way. We know that. But being prepared changes our response in times of trouble. It'll transform your home. We need to teach our young people God's plan for the home, Genesis chapter 2. One man, one woman, leaving father and mother, cleaving to each other, they twain becoming one flesh. When you find two individuals who are completely prepared to do that, who have prepared themselves individually to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, who have prepared themselves individually to leave mom and daddy, and who have prepared themselves individually to be joined together to another person, and then those two individuals who are prepared enter into the bond of marriage, and I'll show you a marriage made in heaven. Not because it will be free of trouble, but because it was designed in heaven. And God gave us those parameters. We need to prepare our children. Ephesians chapter 6, bring your children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. By the way, if we're not preparing our children for heaven, you can be sure the world will prepare them for hell. We need to prepare our children. Finally tonight, preparation transforms our view of the end of life. In 2 Timothy 4 and verses 6 through 8, as Paul is nearing the end of his life and he knows that his time of departure is at hand, he writes to his son in the faith, young Timothy. And that phrase in the text, the time of my departure is at hand. Those are traveling terms. It's as if Paul was saying, I'm waiting for my ship to come in. And I think about how many times Paul stood in a city or in a region waiting to travel on to the next area to preach the gospel of Christ, waiting for his ship to carry him to the next location. And now Paul describes the end of his life as simply waiting for the ship that's going to raise its anchor from this life and carry him home to the life to come. And he tells Timothy, I'm ready. I fought a good fight. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge. Paul had stood several times in his life before unrighteous judges. But now he says, I'm going to stand before the righteous judge. And he's going to give me a crown of righteousness, but not to me only, to all them also that love is appearing. You think about that view of death. And then you think about what the Hebrews writer said in Hebrews 10, 26 and 27 when he said, For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, notice, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation. My question to you tonight is how would Jesus find us watching? He says in verse 13, Watch therefore. For you know neither the day nor the hour. How will he find us watching? As a people ready to raise our anchors from this life and sail home? Or a fearful looking toward fiery indignation? My question to you tonight as we bring this lesson to a close is, are you planning to go to heaven? Or are you prepared to go to heaven? There's a difference between those two things. I believe with all of my heart that most everybody, especially those here tonight, want to go to heaven and are planning to go to heaven. But friends, heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. If for whatever reason tonight you're not prepared to go to heaven because you've never obeyed the gospel, then the bride and the spirit say come. Come with faith and a willingness to repent and turn away from the practice of sin. Come with a willingness to confess Jesus Christ as the Son of God. And come with a willingness to be baptized and to have your sins washed away. That will get you ready. But then we've got to stay ready. If for any reason tonight you know that you've obeyed those initial commands, but you've not kept oil in your lamp. And if the bridegroom were to come this very night, you'd have to meet him unprepared. Won't you make it right tonight?
John said, if we confess our faults, God is faithful and just to forgive us. 1 John 1 and verse 9. And just like the father ran out to meet the prodigal, our heavenly father is watching and he's waiting. You've just got to take the first step and then he'll run out and meet you. We'll pray with you. We'll pray for you. Won't you come? While together we stand and sing. Now, the word amen doesn't merely mean I agree. It means so be it. So I want the things that he said to so be in my life. And if you do too, say amen. amen. Now, that's what life is all about, being prepared. It's a sad thought to think there are people who know the will of God, but they waste their life and they don't give God their best. Now, none of us are sinlessly perfect, but there's a difference in giving God your best and making excuses and lounging around and not doing the things you know you need to. And it's these types of sermons and all of them that we've heard that we need. We need these things. We all struggle. We all suffer. We need them. Our brother who spoke tonight was prepared to speak to us. And he helped us to be better prepared. I want to challenge you to go online if you have access to the Internet, Facebook. Send that sermon to some member of the church in a private message that you know is not right with God. I just did it. And I'm not bragging. I'm just trying to lead by example. I sent that in a private message to someone that's near and dear to me who is not right with God, and they are a member of the church. They've fallen away. They need to hear that. We need to hear it. It helps us. Let's get serious, church, 
and not merely plan, but prepare. I know everybody here truly believes this has helped them in preparing. Thank you so much for being here. Your presence here is encouraging any night, including a Friday night. Tomorrow, we will start at 9 a.m., and according to Brock Kendall, there will be coffee before 9 a.m., so if you want to sip coffee before 9 a.m., you can go sip coffee in our climate control facility next door, all right? We want to see you in the morning at 9, 10, and 11, then lunch provided by the Harrisburg Church, then sessions after lunch as well. Hope that you'll stay. Hope that you'll get the lectureship book. If you can't stay for any of those, make sure you get the lectureship book and partake of those uh, lessons in the book. Anything else important that needs to be mentioned before we close tonight? Our brother Rocky, who's one of the fine deacons at the Harrisburg Church, he's going to come and lead us in a dismissal prayer. Will you bow with me? Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, creator and sustainer of all things, we're so thankful for the many blessings of life that you've given us. We, Father, we know that every good gift and every perfect gift comes from you. We're thankful for the opportunity and the freedom to be here tonight, Father, to worship you and study your holy word. Father, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful for the power that's in your word. We're thankful for the many men in attendance tonight that have dedicated their lives to preaching your word. We pray that you continue to be with them and bless them. Father, we're thankful for Jesus our Lord and our Savior. We're thankful for the life that he lived on this earth as an example to all, Father, and the perfect sacrifice he made on the cross on our behalf. Father, we pray that you go with us as we depart here. Father, keep us safe and always guide our way. In Jesus' name.